Okay, so in the previous video, I gave you some definitions of uh, that are important in evolutionary game theory and sort of explained the analogy between classical games and evolution by natural selection. In this video, I want to go through examples of matrix games and how to solve them. And, and these are useful when traits are categorical. So in my experience, a lot of people have probably heard of The Prisoner's Dilemma which is um, a very famous Matrix game. Of course, there are many more, and I'll talk about a couple of these. Uh, I'll talk about Hawk Dove in a second as well. right? So the way The Prisoner's Dilemma works is that you have two people who have just um, you know, done a robbery or some kind of crime, uh, and the police have captured them, and they put them in separate rooms like you see on your favorite crime show. And each player has two options. They can remain silent or they can sort of confess and, and rat out their partner in crime. Um, and I think this is covered, but obviously the blue player can do both things. And what the Matrix game describes is essentially four possible worlds. And those worlds are sort of determined. It's a little bit like a Schrodinger's cat situation. They're determined by the strategies that each player picks, right? So one of those worlds is that nobody confesses and maybe everyone goes free. Or maybe they both confess and try to rat each other out and then they both go to jail. And then obviously there are two more worlds where one confesses and the other doesn't, right? So all of these are basically possible worlds. And one of the ways to understand which of these worlds should exist would be by looking at the benefits and costs of the different actions. And what's interesting is that if you play this game only one time, the uh, Nash Equilibrium, which is also the ESS in this case, turns out to be to rat out your neighbors. So if you ever do a crime with someone that you don't know or trust, you should rat them out as fast as you can, although I don't recommend doing a crime. Right, and so if we go back to evolutionary game theory, lots of traits are categoricals, right? Usually mating strategies in biology are almost by definition, right? So here's an example in plant biology called heterostyly, where some uh, individuals have short male parts and long female parts, or the opposite. And this is meant to be a mechanism for outcrossing, right? The idea is that uh, bees that come to this flower will get pollen on their head, and then they'll deposit it on individuals like this, then they'll get pollen on their uh, backside and deposit that pollen on individuals like this. So the idea is that it should cause some form of outcrossing. There's also a famous lizard with, um, or sorry, a famous example using um, lizards with Barry Cernervo's work, where you have these different colored morphs that also have different behaviors. So um, basically, I think the orange ones are very strong. They can guard big territories, territories full of females. Um, and they can take these away from the blue uh, individuals. But then the blue individuals actually can work together and they can actually sort of uh, exclude the ones that sneak. And then you have these sneaky ones that sneak into the big territories and steal mates. And so basically what happens is if you have multiple individuals in a territory, you can protect from sneakers. If there's only one, you can't. Uh, and if you're busy protecting, you can't beat yourself against this. And it basically turns into a rock, paper, scissors game where you have three strategies that go around and around and around. Right. And then, you know, many of Mendel's traits, just to give a couple more examples, were categorical, right? Smooth versus wrinkled, yellow versus green, purple versus white. Um, not all of them, probably, but some of them were. So let's take this example of heterostyly, right? And how does this work? Well, remember that ESS is a strategy that can't be invaded and at the same time can invade. So it's got this reciprocal invasibility. Um, Remember, success comes in the form of fitness as a per capita population growth rate. And these four different things describe four different worlds, depending on what the world looks like. Right. So in this corner, we have a world where everyone has long stamens and a short pistol. In this one, we have a world where everyone has short stamens and a long pistol. And then we have this sort of mixed world where they uh, both co-occur and get uh, different payoffs depending on who they're mating with. Right. If this one tries to mate here, then they're successful if this works the way it's supposed to work. So to solve for the ESS in a two by two matrix game, literally all you have to do is compare a couple numbers and check which one is bigger. There's more sophisticated ways of doing this, but this is what I teach my freshmen. So if you write it like this, and, and you, you should be aware that not everyone writes it the way I write it, but if you write the player and the opponent, so this is your focal sort of player, you just compare vertically to determine who's gonna win. And again, if you're looking at games in books or online, different people write them different ways. So uh, this isn't a hard and fast rule. But again, there's four possible outcomes when we look at these sort of uh, three possible worlds now and the different comparisons. One of those is that one of them is the pure ESS. Nature should only have one kind of thing and it might be either one, um, right? Then that, that's the second option is it's the other one. The two strategies might coexist, right? As in the case of heterostyly in real life, the two things generally coexist. 
Um, you could also have this funny kind of alternative stable states, or sometimes people call this a priority effect, where um, the evolutionary solution is that either one can be there, but uh, only one at a time. So basically, whoever gets there first gets to stay and exclude the other, but it might be either one. So we can go through this and we can take a look at uh, maybe when is having long stamens, the male parts, the ESS, um, the pure ESS, so that it's the only thing, right? So we have to ask two questions. Can it resist invasion? And can it invade when rare? So imagine you've got an island. Everyone has long stamens. We can figure out what their fitness is on this island by reading this off of the different possible worlds, right? So player, opponent, this guy's fitness is A. Um, Right, so we can just figure out that that's the world that this island is currently in. But now imagine you get a rare mutation or maybe a seed blows in from the mainland on the wind um, that has the short statement option. Well, now what is the fitness of this guy in this island? Well, since he only is encountering the blue guys uh, with the long stamens, his fitness is going to be C. And so the question is, um, can this one resist invasion from this? Well, it can do that when two things are true, right? It has to have a higher per capita population growth rate in the current world than it would in the world with the, the mixed population. So you need, if, if that's the case, then, then uh, it can resist invasion, right? If A is greater than C. But now imagine that the world had started a different way. We had a different sequence of mutations or colonization events. And then the island had everyone having short stamens to begin with, right? This is an alternative reality. Well, we can figure out what everyone's fitness on this island is by reading off the possible worlds here, and it's gonna be D, right? Because this is the possible world that this island describes right now. Now we have a rare mutation or a new colonization, right? What is this guy's fitness gonna be? Again, we read it off of these possible worlds, he's going to be getting B. If B is greater than D, then we expect this guy, remember it's a per capita population growth rate, we expect this guy to spread through the population and eventually change the island. So under these two conditions, then the long stamen short pistol is the pure ESS. And no matter how you start the world, it's going to end up on an island with pure long stamen individuals. And so if you've written the matrix game the way I write them with the player on this side, then basically if, if the top row numbers uh, are greater than the bottom row numbers, that's when you're going to get this strategy. We could ask the reverse question, right? So remember the other option is that the short stamens are an ESS. And it just works exactly the same way. We have to check two things. Can it resist invasion? And can it invade when rare? Right, so now we start the island this way. The possible world we're in right now gets a payoff of D. That's the survival and reproduction, the per capita population growth rate. So they get a, a survival rate of D. Now we get our mutation or our new colonization. That guy comes into this world where he's getting a fitness of B. Um, and now we're asking when can this guy defend the invasion? And it's basically just going to be the opposite conditions, right? So now we need this fitness to be higher than this fitness. Just like before, we can start the island another way in a different alternative reality. We know that everyone on this island right now would be getting a fitness of A, just like before. We get our rare mutation. They're getting a fitness of C, just like before. But now, if C is greater than A, then we would expect the red guys with the uh, short stamens and the long pistons to invade the island and take over the island. And so again, if you've written it the way I've written it, basically if the bottom row is greater than the top row, all of them, then you get this second condition. Now, of course, this isn't how heterostyly works in the real world, right? So we can ask, when are both strategies the ESS? And remember, there's sort of two versions of this. So we can check the two things. Can it resist invasion and can it invade when rare? And what we're going to find is that if both can invade when rare, but neither can resist invasion, then we're going to get them both coexisting. So start the island with pure long stamen. Just like before, everyone's getting a fitness of A. We read it off the sort of possible worlds here. We get our mutation, but now, Right, our mutation now is getting C. We read that off the possible worlds here. But now, if C is greater than A, then we're gonna move into a world where there's going to be both of them coexisting. So um, the long stamen guy cannot resist invasion of the red guy. Okay, so now we need to ask, can, the, can it invade one rare? And if it can, then we're gonna get them to coexist, right? Reciprocal invasibility. So the possible world we're in now is getting a fitness payoff of D. We get our rare mutation, who's getting a fitness payoff of B. And now, if B is greater than D, then we get pushed into the corners. We get pushed into these possible worlds where the two are coexisting rather than one of these possible worlds where, um, 
where you have either one or the other. And this is probably the way the world actually works, right? So you get pushed into these corners if this one is bigger than this, and this one is bigger than this. So neither one of these can resist invasion, but both of them can invade one rare. So no matter where you start the world, you're going to end up with both of them at the same time. But the opposite can also happen, right? Where uh, neither one can invade when rare, but both of them can resist invasion. And that's where we get the alternative stable states. So hopefully I can go through this relatively quick. We have this possible world. Everyone gets a fitness of A. We get a rare mutation who's getting a fitness of C. But now if A is greater than C, it's gonna be t pushing us in this direction. Okay, so then that means that this guy is gonna potentially go extinct. Start the opposite way. Everyone's getting a fitness of D. We get the rare mutation, who's getting a fitness of B. Um, but now, if D is greater than B, again, it's going to push us in this direction. And it means that that guy is going to go extinct. Um, and so that's pushing us into the opposite corners. It's pushing us into each of these pure worlds. Um, so neither one can invade when rare, and both of them can resist invasion. That means that depending on which mutation came first, depending on which one colonized the island first, whether it's ecology or evolution that put them there, um, you can only have one at a time, but it could be either. And then one more thing, remember I said, so that's predicting the traits now, right? We can predict whether or not there's gonna be one trait, two traits, and which trait it's going to be, but we can also predict the ecology. We can also predict how many of each kind um, in these different cases, right? So if, if only the long stamens are the ESS, well then that's boring. It's gonna be 100% long stamens. And the same in this world, it's going to be 100% short statements. With option four, the alternative stable states, the answer depends on the history of evolution, as we just saw. But again, it's going to be 100% one or the other, which is kind of boring. But option three is where things get interesting, right? We can actually get the coexistence. And here we can actually predict how much we would expect of each kind, which is really cool, right? So if you let P be the frequency of the long statement individuals, um, then that means that one minus p, because there's only two things, right? One minus p is the frequency of the other kind, right? So if you sum p and one minus p, you're going to get 100% of things. And so now we can figure out if, if both of these are coexisting, what is the average fitness that one of these individuals is going to get? Well, it turns out to just be a weighted sum of these two numbers weighted by the frequency, right? So the guys with long stamens are going to encounter other long stamen guys p percent of the time or p uh, proportion of the time, and the other guy is one minus p proportion of the time. And so we can just multiply those fitnesses together to get the average fitness. And we could do the same with the player. So again, if you've written it the way I've written it, you go left to right for um, frequency, and you go up and down to work, it out, work out the ESS. And then it turns out that at equilibrium, we need these two species to have equal fitness. Otherwise, um, one will eventually overwhelm the other demographically. And so if you set those two equations equal to each other, do a little bit of algebra to rearrange, we can actually calculate what the uh, equilibrium abundance is going to be of each kind. Just in case you want to see the work, um, you know, here's the, the rearranging. Um, I'll let you pause the video, and I'm not going to go through it. What's interesting is that heterostylia is often an ESS, right? We see this often in nature where you, you see this, this strategy all the time, right? And so one thing that's exciting about knowing the definition of an ESS is we actually know some things about the numbers that we would put in here if, instead of letters, right? We know that C is greater than A and B is greater than D, right? You could even think, well, what if this was a perfect mechanism for outcrossing? What if these guys could never reproduce with their same kind? We could go further and we could even put zeros in uh, for these two things. And what's interesting is that as long as, um, so as long as C is greater than zero and B is greater than zero, we'll find that coexistence is the ESS. And even more interestingly, if B is equal to C, we would find that the frequency would be 50-50. And so if the frequency deviates from 50-50, then you might actually be able to calculate uh, values of B and C. So the second example I want to go through is the Hawk Dove game, which is one of the earliest evolutionary games, perhaps the first one ever to be created. And it asks the question, why do some organisms actually fight? Why do they confront with aggression? And others avoid fights by doing ritualized displays. So uh, National Geographic has a TV show called Animal Fight Club, and this is their cover image, right? Lots of you have probably seen uh, 
animals fighting over resources to protect territories or to get mates or to get food, right? That there are lots of organisms who actually fight. But there are other organisms like the red-winged blackbird, um, and I'll show you an example here, that this is the red-winged blackbird defending its territory. So the question becomes, why does that work? You would think that if another red-winged blackbird flew into the territory and just pecked this guy's eyes out, that that would be the evolutionarily stable strategy. So why do some animals fight like this and other animals use these ritualized display was actually a problem that confused biologists for decades. Um, and so the um, hawk-dove game was a way of potentially trying to solve this. And so how does the hawk-dove game work? Well, the idea is, that hawks and doves are not meant to be different species, right? So the names and the pictures people use are often, they often seem designed to confuse you. Um, that's not what's going on here. They're, they're just, in, in instead you should imagine two phenotypes in a single population, right? One that fights and one that does a dance or sings a song or something, right? So this is our singing red, -win red winged blackbird playing the dove strategy and a red winged blackbird that comes in and pecks his eyes out is playing the hawk strategy. Right, and then there is some benefit to fighting, which we usually define as B, sometimes V for victory, um, which could be access to mates or food or a territory, it doesn't matter. It's some benefit in evolutionary context that gives you increased fitness, increased survival, increased reproduction. Fighting also has costs in terms of potentially reducing your survival and ability to reproduce, right? Injury or death is potentially going to impose a fitness cost on you. And then often you could imagine that displays have costs as well, right? So you waste time singing a song or doing a dance that you could have spent uh, doing other things. It might take longer to do a display, who knows what. Right, so what are the rules? Um, right, so the rules are that doves will always avoid fights. So if that if that um, red-winged blackbird that wants to peck the other guy's eyes out comes, the, the singing one flies away. So hawks will always win. They always get all of the resources in that interaction. Right, so we can draw that possible world where these things coexist, right? A hawk versus a dove is always gonna get all the benefits and a dove versus a hawk is always gonna get nothing. Cool. If two hawks fight, we imagine across an enormous population that the odds are 50-50 for any average individual, um, but they all have a personal cost of injury, right? So taking an average across the population, it's gonna be you know, half the benefits, of, you, know, you win half your fights, you lose half your fights, and you pay the cost of, of potentially getting injured. When two doves display, there's a chance that I might have a better song or however, uh, you know, red-winged blackbirds work out their differences. So it's still 50-50 that whether or not I'll win the interaction, but I get to do this without a cost. So I'm gonna show you a simpler version of the game that doesn't have that, that cost of displaying T, but you could imagine if you wanted to put it in here, you could put B over two minus T. And some people do it that way and it has different solutions. Right, so we could ask, what does a pure population of hawks look like? Well, we can do it just like before, right? We, we would expect the top row to be greater than the bottom row such that we're always being driven into this corner here. That happens when B over two minus C is greater than zero. And we need B to be greater than B over two. Right, so condition two is trivial. That's true no matter what. And if we rearrange this condition, we find that we need uh, B to be greater than about twice the costs, if this is the way the world is. Or you can rearrange an inequality just like any equation. When would doves be a pure ESS? Well, basically it's just the opposite conditions that are gonna drive us down into this corner, right? So we need uh, zero to be greater than B over two, and we need B over two divided by B. So now condition two really matters, right? It can never be satisfied. So it means that doves are never gonna be the ESS in the formulation of the game. It's never going to be a pure ESS. Um, but if the costs are more expensive than the benefits, two times the cost, then hawks aren't the ESS either. In that case, we get a mixed ESS, right? And if P, just like before, P is the proportion of hawks in the population, then we can multiply side to side to figure out that the uh, average fitness of a hawk is going to be uh, P times this and one minus P times this, right? It's going to encounter hawks P proportion of the time and doves one minus p proportion of the time. 
So that's the average fitness of an average hawk across all its interactions in the population. And the dove is the same, right? It's, it's p times zero, one minus p times half. We need the fitness to be equal at equilibrium. Otherwise, one is gonna demographically overwhelm the other, right? So they have to have equal fitness at equilibrium. And so we can do some algebra and we can figure out that, not surprisingly, p star is b divided by two over c. There are lots more examples of famous matrix games that I'm not gonna go over. You can find them on Wikipedia. Maybe you could find other videos, right? The Battle of the Sexes, Snowdrift, Chicken, The Prisoner's Dilemma that I already showed you, but we didn't really talk about how to solve. Um, and I can also, I should also say matrix games can be any dimension. They don't have to be two by two, but they become more complicated beyond two by two, right? So um, Maynard Smith and Price used computers even in 1976 to solve the games that they presented when they basically invented evolutionary game theory. And so um, matrix games are valuable and they're important in evolutionary biology, but I would argue they have somewhat limited use. So I've published several of them before um, and I think they have use, but it's limited, right? So if you can boil the problem down to something like this, do the thing or don't do the thing, right? That's kind of what the hawk dove game was. Um, fight or don't fight. The prisoner's dilemma is the same way. Cooperate, don't cooperate, right? Then that possibly can be boiled down. It also works really well, as in the case of uh, Barry Sonerbo's lizards or heterostyle, if you just happen to have a world with categorical strategies, then of course you need to use uh, matrix games. But, yeah, so heterostyle. But if you have an example like, um, plant height that has a continuous trait, you could potentially try to think about tall and short plants or maybe make it three dimensional. So you've got tall and medium and really short, but but it, it's really unnatural, right? And so these have uh, really limited uses. And the key is going back to my original question about um, what structures diversity and mechanisms of coexistence. Many of the traits that we think matter in nature are continuous, right? So here's just an example from plant ecology again. This is in a paper by Sandra Diaz in Nature in 2015, um, right? We, bio, plant biologists think things like, what's the nitrogen concentration of your leaves? How much is your total leaf area? What is the size of your seeds? How tall are you? How dense is your stem? Um, how thick are your leaves? And all of these are continuous variables, right? They can vary from lots of leaves to small leaves. Um, big seeds to small fern spores and all these kinds of things. And so the next video, I'm going to talk about the utility of uh, continuous evolutionary games and how we can potentially use game theory still when we don't have categorical traits like we do for a matrix game. So if you're still interested, you can go ahead and watch, uh, watch that video.